Welcome to Leading Life, the show all about living to the fullest and leading life on your terms. You will learn tips, tools, and strategies for achieving total personal transformation. I'm Bren. And I'm Cam. This is Leading Life. Hello, 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 and welcome to another awesome episode of the Leading Life Podcast. This is episode 22, actually. We're really starting to pick up some steam here. So I'm feeling really good about this. Cam, how are you feeling about episode 22 of Leading Life? Dude, I feel really good. And I'm glad we're getting all <laughs> these different kinds of minds because sometimes, no offense, but I get sick of just you and me, you know? So it's nice to have some other people in on the podcast. That hits me right here, Cam. <laughs> I'm sure it does. I never thought you'd get sick of me, bro. <laughs> No, but uh, we had a great episode last week. Last week is just me and you, so it was pretty cool. But, you know, we've got a bunch of speakers lined up for the next few episodes anyways. And one of them tonight is Berge. And he is a motivational speaker who I think we met through the Miracle Morning community, which is a great community full of, you know, like-minded, positive people. And uh, he's here today to show us, help share with us kind of his message, which is breaking down the wall. So, Berge, how's it going, man? It's going really well. I'm excited about being on Podcast 22 because two days ago, I met someone who had a 2-2 tattooed on her finger. This was meant to be. It is meant to be. The universe is saying the universe things. works like that. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how did you get here on our podcast? Wow, that's a really good question because, frankly, I think that's where we met. I think it was through – I know it was through Facebook somehow. Mm-hmm. And I'm guessing it was through the Miracle Morning. But for, for whatever reason, we were connected somehow before that. I'm really not quite sure. So how I ended up here at the very end of this, I'm really not quite sure other than... Uh, but if you're asking how I came to be a motivational speaker, I think maybe that's more about what you're asking. <laughs> a little bit of both. Yeah, let's hear it. That was a, that was a, was a pretty uh, interesting journey about... I was a high school band director for a long time. And... At the beginning of my career, this is before we had internet and all that kind of stuff, all that kind of great stuff. Yeah, I'm that old. And I was flipping through the channels one Sunday to watch football, and I saw this speaker on PBS. I don't know if you all have PBS up there, but it's basically educational programming, which I almost never watched back then. And I saw this speaker, and I couldn't change the channel. I watched him for 90 minutes. And I, I've never experienced anything like it before. The guy was a motivational speaker. And ironically enough, I'd never heard a motivational speaker before, and I had never heard of a motivational speaker before. I didn't even know what it was, but I knew I couldn't turn away. So I watched this program for 90 minutes, and at the end of it, up on the screen behind him, it said Les Brown. I'm sure you guys know who Les Brown is. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So I see it's Les Brown. Okay, I didn't know who the guy was back then. I found out later on that it was his big break. But I spent the next few weeks trying to find that program on PBS again, which I I never saw it again, but I found some of his books and I started to read his books. And what I did is I started to transfer the type of teaching I I did. I, I changed the kind of teacher I was. Instead of thinking of myself as a music teacher, I was a high school band director. I considered myself to be a success coach for my students and I started to teach them more about being successful and using musical music as a vehicle to teach that and lo and behold this is how things work when you have your mind set on something and I say mind set because it's all about mindset and I had my mind set on learning more about Les Brown I couldn't stop thinking about what I learned from him. Every time I saw a book, an article, a video, I had to watch it, read it, listen to it. About five years ago, through a business I was I was working in, I met someone, and he and I ended up speaking at an event together. Afterwards, we, we grabbed a beer and started talking to each other and found out that he wanted to be a speaker as well. At the time, I, I only had aspirations of being a speaker. And because we had that conversation, he said, you know, do you know who Les Brown is? I said, yeah, of course I know who Les Brown is. And I told him what I just told you. And he said to me, my parents are friends with Les Brown. Wow. I mean, that rocked my world. That totally rocked my world. That was in September 
And the following January, I was sitting in a room with 24 other people and Les Brown in a training session. It was unbelievable. I, I, don't, I, I don't know how that kind of thing just happens by accident. I don't think it yeah. does. But that's what happened. And ever since that moment, I just had it in my head. I've got to make this speaking thing happen. I had always had it in my heart to do it. But it was then that I realized I've got to make it happen. This is this is what I want. This is who I am inside. And that's yeah. that's where it got started. <laughs> now that's that's amazing. That totally reminds me of you know my story a little bit and Cam's story where you know you just see something or somebody and you get so inspired and so you know enveloped in what they're doing and and you want to go and share that and and you know become that yourself. That's amazing. So tell us a little bit about how you know, you went from really seeing that and wanting to be as a motivational speaker to developing your message and, and what you're going to share with us today. That's a really good question. And I'll never forget. Well, let me just back it up a little bit. Yeah. From the time I saw him and that's all I wanted to do. So I had a, I had a room full of captive students. I had a captive audience every day for most of, most of my teaching career. So when I taught, I envision myself, and I think this is something that a lot of people learn to do. I, for whatever reason, just did it naturally because I wanted to be in that place. So I envisioned myself on a stage with big speakers and with a screen on each side and the mic here. So when I was speaking to my students, I was speaking to an audience of 1,000 people or 2,000 people. That's what I envisioned all the time. For year after year after year, day after day after day, I did that. And... I got to the point where I was tired of my job. I just, I didn't want to be there anymore. It wasn't, it wasn't fueling me. It wasn't exciting me. And I felt like I wasn't the effective teacher that I could be. And I, I made a pledge to myself when I started teaching that I never wanted to, to become that person. I never wanted to be that person who was just working a job to work it and get paid. So I left early before all of my retirement kicked in so that I could pursue what, what was basically my dream to be a speaker and to be a motivational speaker. So I literally walked away from my job. One day I said, that's it. I'm done. I turned in my resignation and, a, and two months later I was free. I was on my own and I had not one stinking clue of how to do what I wanted to do and how to accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. Not the slightest clue. I had days where I laid in bed all day wondering, what did I do? How am I going to figure this out? What do I need to do? Because I had no stinking clue. A friend of mine said to me one day, what's your platform? And I couldn't articulate it to him. I was embarrassed, and I kind of felt like almost like a failure at the time. So I knew I had to figure that out. And what I did was I began reading more than I normally did, and then I started to practice speaking. I practiced and practiced and practiced. I'd walk around the house practicing until what I felt my platform was just organically was spoken out of my mouth. And one day, I, I was standing literally right next to where I'm sitting right now. And I said, break down the wall to your success zone. And I froze in my tracks. The hairs on the back of my neck stood up. I knew I had figured out exactly what it was that my platform was. I'd taken all of it and put it into a clear, concise title or message. That's kind of how I came to that point. So what's great about it, which I, what I like about it is in any part of our lives, in anything we do, there is some kind of wall you've got to break down. There's some type of barrier you have put up for yourself. There's some type of limit to what you think you can achieve. And it works in any walk of life. It works in anything we want to do, whether it be exercise, eating, having a business, getting a promotion at work, being a better parent, being a better friend, saving more money, having a, a better financial outlook. Whatever it is, it's there. It works in all, all of those areas. So I was really excited when I figured that out, and I've been building upon that ever since. That's awesome. I'm I'm actually looking forward to hearing that. So you got to tell me now what 
explain kind of uh elaborate a little bit so you discovered this you know the title or the you know the message the mission statement of what it is your message is but i want to know kind of the details like how did this come about and well you told us how it came about but what exactly is breaking down the wall do you have any kind of tips strategies so what i did was when i finally had that title i had a lot of uh a lot of just ideas over my head for what it's about so i started to put things down on paper and designed how you break down the wall how does one go about breaking down whatever barrier they have no matter what part of life it is so what would apply to everything what would apply to uh you know being more efficient at work what would apply to being a a, a better athlete what would apply to getting that promotion at work or what would apply to being a better leader and i found out that there were the same principles for all of them it was all about mindset everything was about mindset and when you've got the mindset if you don't have that first if you don't have that what i call belief that self-belief that positive self-belief in yourself if that's not there first people tend to fail and the reason they fail is because they never really believed before so they do this thing called try i'll try to lose weight I'll try to get a promotion at work. I'll try to save more money. I'll try to be a better parent. I'll try to be more punctual. And they try. But all that word try means is I'll make an attempt, and when it becomes difficult, when it becomes a little bit uncomfortable, I'll give up, I'll quit, and I'll go back. And all my friends will say, that's okay. You tried. They'll pat you on the back, make you feel good. All your enabling friends that you need to get rid of because they're really not being friendly at that point. They're trying to keep you back where they are. People feel good about it and they say, that's it. I'm done. It didn't work. And they blame it on a system, an idea, rather than the fact that they never built that foundation for belief first. They tried to jump the gun and do things. What I, I like to say people do things backwards. The sexy part of anything is crossing the finish line. And everyone wants to cross the finish line first. They don't want to put the work in. And we do things backwards. And when you do things backwards, you fail. If you were to plant a tree backwards, you'd have the leaves sprouting before you even planted a seed in the ground. And an upside-down tree doesn't work. The roots work in the ground. The roots, when they go into the ground, they provide the nutrients for the tree, and they provide the stability that holds the tree up. And if you don't have those roots in there, the trunk never grows and the leaves never grow. But when those leaves grow... They have photosynthesis, and that feeds the tree some more nutrients, which allow the roots to grow deeper and stronger to build a bigger tree, a bigger trunk, and even more leaves. So it's a cycle. So what I found out was there's this these three pillars to success. I call it believe, decide, and act. And I liken the belief part to building that root system, to growing that root system that a tree has. When you build that strong enough, that trunk starts to grow, and that's the decision. That's the part a lot of people confuse with the word try. They say, I've decided to do X, I've decided to do Y, but really in their mindset, it's really a try. It's not real. And that's the part that gets difficult. So when, as soon as they start to act and things are uncomfortable or difficult, as I said earlier, they quit. And the reason is they have no root system that feeds them the nutrients, no root system to support them. And the bigger your dream the bigger the root system has to be. If you don't have a big root system, that, that big tree is going to fall over. Last summer, I was in, uh, in around Berkeley, California, San Francisco, California, and I went to Muir Woods, which is, I don't know if you've ever been there, if you know what area I'm talking about, but they have an enormous, enormous redwoods there. And I'd been there once before, but I happened to be uh, in that area for a Brendan Burchard event that just finished, and I had some time before I came home so I drove around like crazy, seeing all the different sites I wanted to see, and I decided I wanted to see the redwoods again. And those trees have lasted for hundreds and hundreds of years because of the root system that they have, because of the nutrients that they get from that, and because they built themselves from the ground up patiently and over time. Yeah. Cam, what do you got about that? 
Well, obviously, the bigger the dream, the bigger the root system. You know, if you're shooting for the stars, you, you better have a lot of belief in yourself and your abilities. So, you did you say you had a metaphor for action? The, act, the action is, well, so the, the root system is belief, the trunk is decide, and the leaves are the action. Because that's the part people go to see, right? That's the sexy part of the tree. Not too many people say, hey, let's go into for a walk in the in the uh, park because i'd like to take a look at the roots let's watch the roots grow no one really cares you go to see the beautiful leaves on the tree this time of the year people love, like to see the trees leaves changing colors in the summertime they like to see when they bloom in the wintertime people aren't quite as interested i have noticed that like um when people achieve great things most people look at them and say oh they're so lucky they're at the right place at the right time, you know, they're, they're right. born with that talent or whatever because they can't see the roots, you know, that's probably why. They don't, like, see all the time and effort and the decision-making and the sacrifices it took and all the practice, you know. Absolutely. I, I, like to, I like to tell people this. I think it's such an important quote. I heard this a long time ago. I have no idea who it's attributed to, but the quote goes like something, something like this. It's not who you are that holds you back. It's who you think you are not. And that's so important to, to grasp and take to heart because people look at themselves in a finite way. They say, this is who I am. I'm not that person who has a lot of money. I'm not the person who can be super successful. I'm not the person who can own you know, 300 stores in a franchise. I'm not the person who can speak up in front of the room. I'm not that person. It's not who you are that holds you back. It's who you think you're not that holds you back. And I'll, I, you guys know who Michael Phelps is. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask you this question. When did Michael Phelps become an Olympic gold swimmer? When he started believing in himself? That's, that's about right. The, what I tell people is he became an Olympic gold swimmer when he began to train like an Olympic gold swimmer. When he got a coach that Olympic gold swimmer would have when he began to eat yeah. the way an Olympic gold swimmer eats when he began to sleep the way an Olympic gold medalist sleeps when he began to have the schedule that an Olympic gold medalist has when he did all this, all the same things that an Olympic gold medalist does that's when he became an Olympic gold medalist he, the rest of the world simply recognized it when they put the medal around his neck very true, because, I mean, to put it in a negative twist, um, when people are told, you know, you have cancer, you're diagnosed with some sort of cancer, and they usually act as a terminally ill person would act, you know, they, they you know, stay at home or they try to experience whatever, or a lot of them just, they're told to stop exercising, you know, don't, don't push your body to its limits, but really what they should be doing is acting like, a healthy, vi vital person would act. Right. That's exactly right. I had, I had a former student, this is going back years and years ago, who when he was born, uh, there, were, there were some complications when he was born, and he almost died. And because he almost died, his, his parents coddled him somewhat. And he had this relationship with his mom where he was sick, and she took care of him. And he grew up like that. But when he was out with his friends, he was fine. So uh, this is when I was a high school band director, and I would take the, the band away to a camp because we were just a lot more productive there without the distractions of the rest of the world. And I remember this one morning, he, he, had, he had food allergies. And if he ate something that, that he was allergic to, he would get flu-like symptoms. He, he would take some medication afterwards, and in a couple of hours, he was fine. This particular morning, he ate something he shouldn't have, and he wasn't feeling well. So he asked me if he could sit on the sideline for a little a little bit in the morning. I said, sure, no problem. He took took his medication. And in, a, and in about an hour or two, he was fine. Came back on the field. We had lunch. He was out with the rest of the kids playing tennis, playing some volleyball. And that day, coincidentally, his parents decided to come up to visit for the afternoon. When they got there, his demeanor changed from this healthy kid to this person who was sick. And suddenly he was slumped over and came over to me and asked if he could sit out again. And I looked at him and I said, no, you were just playing volleyball. You were just playing tennis. 
get out on the field. You're fine. And he went out and he was fine. But it's about what you think. It's about those triggers in life that tell you something about yourself and, and you're believing it. And you can, you can be whatever you believe you are. Have you ever heard of a book called uh, Mach 2 with Your Hair on Fire? No. I've never heard of that. Great book. It's uh, written by a gentleman named Richard, book, Richard Brooke. And the book is a, talks about how you can create a different movie in your mind. So most people have one movie that they play all the time. And they believe that movie. But you can change the movie in your mind. It's up to you. Because everything you are today, everything you've become at this point is a product of what you've believed about yourself up until now. Some other person that you meet on the street believes whatever they believe about themselves because of the sum of all of their experiences. It's not how they were born, it's the sum of their experiences. Granted, where you're born and how you were treated has a lot to do with it, but they are also experiences. And of course, we all have tendencies. But the, the fact is, if, you're some, if you are the sum of what you have experienced in life and you've believed in, about yourself in life, then you can simply change that by believing things in a different way, believing some other things about yourself and feeding other things to your mind and getting a different input. Because everything, the way he explains it in the book, it's really interesting. He basically says that everything you believe about yourself is a lie. Everything, whether you believe you are the most successful person in the world or you are the least successful person in the world, it's he calls it a lie because it's just what we tell ourselves. It's not real. It's what we tell ourselves. So I have a friend, my buddy James. He and I partner in, in, uh, in some uh, events that we do together. And he's the perfect partner for me because I'm that ER guy who's always got that voice in the back of my head telling me, you're not going to do well enough. You're not going to do good enough. Who do you think you are? No one's going to show up. Why would anyone show up to see you? And he's like, throw me on stage. Let's go. Everyone's going to be We're going to have a 1,000 people. It's going to be amazing. And however it turns out, he's excited and pumped up. And I feed off of his energy. But he's told himself one set of ideas. And I've told myself another, another set of ideas. And it's simply what we've told ourselves. So is he right or am I right? I'm right for my reality. He's right for his reality. That's really what it comes down to. Yeah, that's what um, there's a. I think it was Henry Ford. Like, if you think, what was it? If you think you can, you can. Yeah. If you think you can't, you can't. Yeah. Either way, you're right, which yeah. is so true. So true. Because once you start noticing that, hey, I can actually do this. That's when you start taking action. You know, that's when you start actually wanting to take. Because if you don't think you're able to do it, then you never. You'll never begin. You know, and it's it's unbelievable what um, just what thinking in like what your thoughts are can have an effect on what you're doing at that moment. Like I noticed, um, I don't know, Brennan can relate. <laughs> when you wake up in the morning, you're at this default like curl up and sleep more kind of state. You know, oh, I can totally relate to that. <laughs> yeah, and um, you think you're really tired, but you're not. Cause have you ever woken up like ten minutes late and you you gotta go somewhere and like people are on your ass about it and you better you like show up you know or as an example like I was really really tired and I was asking myself in the morning just in bed I woke up and I was like why am I this tired in the morning I get a message about my from my best friend saying hey what time are we filming today and bam I was up because I was reminded what my mission was I was reminded of why I'm here but when you wake up and you're not really thinking about anything your default is like, I am so tired right now, go back to sleep, right? It's cold, snuggle up to the blankets a little bit more. And uh, what I actually used to do also is um, I'd have an alarm clock, and when the alarm goes off, everybody hates the alarm, right? They just shut it off and go back to sleep or unplug it or whatever. But what I did, I, I threw my microphone on top of it, and uh, <laughs> I woke up, and I would touch my microphone. I'd be like, okay, I need to live stream right now. Let's go, you know, or I'd touch a pair of my shoes, Say, reminding me, like, hey, go for a run. There's a reason you set this alarm. You know what I mean? So, just little reminders Does like that. that. What's that? Does that work for you? Oh, absolutely. It works like like nothing. You wouldn't believe the amount of energy you actually have. But uh, like a quote, Tony Robbins says, emotion or sorry, energy comes from having a mission. 
And he, he was in an interview talking about mornings. And that's like the first thing he said was energy comes from having a mission. And when I heard that, it blew my mind. So I knew that I had to somehow remind myself of my mission every single morning so that I have that energy and I have that belief in myself that I could actually do things, you know? I'm a big follower of Brendan Burchard. I've been to several of his events and something he says at all of them. In fact, that's like a mantra. He has everyone repeat throughout the four days of his events is the power plant doesn't have energy. The power plant generates energy and we have to be a power plant. We don't have energy. We generate energy. So don't expect like, okay, well, why don't I have energy? You have to generate the energy. And that's the hardest part too. That's the hardest part is actually like without any, any, any energy starting up. You know, the hardest part is like getting up and putting on your shoes and going outside. Running is not that difficult, but getting yourself out there is the hard part. It's almost like, uh, I like the metaphor of like the amount of fuel it takes for a rocket to get into space is right. like 50 times more than it takes from the rocket in space to get to Mars, you know? Right. And it's so true. And, 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 and it's, it's the same thing with, with when you want to accomplish a task. You know, let's say, let's say someone decides, you know what, I want to go back to school. I want to change my career. Okay, well, you've got to go back to school. Maybe you have to spend some time saving money for it. Then you have to spend some time applying to school. You get into school, you've got to take all these different classes, and you've got to study and do all this work for four years, five years. might be six or seven years if you're going part-time. And then when you're done, then you have to start putting those applications in to other jobs and eventually you get that job and the promotion and the lifestyle you want or maybe you want to start a business and there's the same thing where you've got to start studying and you've got to get some belief in yourself and you've got to learn more about the field and start to meet other entrepreneurs and other people that you need to be connected with all of that takes a lot of time but people want to end at the finish line so you're laying in bed and you're maybe it's a cool winter morning and you're laying there and you're thinking is this really gonna happen like, if I get up and I go running today, is that going to do any good for me? Is, is there going to be any change in my life if I don't go running today? So people give up because they don't have that belief in it. The reality is if you don't go running one day, no, there's probably not going to be a change in your life. Nothing's going to change much. But if you don't go running that day, it's probably more likely the next day you'll say, well, there was no big deal yesterday. I won't go today either. And then you start to develop that tendency or that habit of not getting up to do it. And then it takes even more energy when you really want to do it. Absolutely. I noticed also is like the state that you're in when you make that decision matters more than the decision itself. You know what I mean? Like uh, the old saying, don't go grocery shopping when you're starving. Because you'll just, you'll buy the entire store because you're in that state of like, I want this, I want that. Ooh, that looks good. Let's grab that too. You know? Right. So when you're in this state, curling up in bed, when you're in that state, you're cold and you just, you don't want to go outside. It's winter outside anyways. You'll be even colder. So when you're in that state, you're automatically going to think about, oh, how cold it is and how hard it is going to, it's going to run and the snow in my face or whatever. You know what I mean? You're going to think about um, all the negatives. But if you were already up with your shoes on, and like you have that energy, maybe you had a coffee or maybe you did some push-ups, you got your blood going already, that's when you make the decision. So that like that's why I try not to think about anything at all. Like I try not to think in the morning until I'm up and going, you know? Right. So tomorrow morning, tomorrow afternoon for lunch, I'm meeting this gentleman. His name is James Spooner. And James is, he's about 70 years old, and he is a former supervisor of instruction for the Napoleon Hill Foundation. Oh, that's awesome. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. So I interviewed him uh, on a podcast about a month and a half ago, and he said things to me during that interview. I've done a lot of reading. I've read a lot of personal development. I've read a lot of books. I've been to a lot of events. I've spent probably somewhere around $20,000 or more going to events. And I've heard a lot of things. He said this one specific thing I had never heard before. And it's become my mantra. He said, Berge, I don't believe in goals. Because people use that word too frivolously. 
They use it like it's no big deal. People talk about goals all the time. Most of the time, they're just in their head. They never write it down. They never write out a plan. And even if they do, it's a goal. And if you don't make it, well, I didn't hit my goal. Okay. It's no big deal. It's something that's become commonplace for people to not achieve a goal. But if you ask people about a promise and how many people stay true to their promise, the number goes way up. It goes almost to 100%. So when you promise something to someone, you follow through on that promise. And I teach people, he said, to make promises rather to, than to set goals. And when he said that, I could hear angels singing, the light bulb went off on my head. <laughs> it was crazy. So two weeks ago, so I've allowed myself in the last, and I'm going to be really transparent on here. Hopefully no one listens to this. No, hopefully a lot of people listen to this. I, I've allowed myself in the last three years to get way out of shape. I was in ridiculous, ridiculous shape. And I've allowed myself to get out of shape. And I've struggled in the past few years to get myself back into that mode where I'm working out all the time and in that mindset where I'm craving it and I want to do it every single day and I'm all about what I'm eating and I'm all about uh, how I'm working out and doing it every day and setting this, this whole thing up to be successful. So I, I remember I just said, I promise I'm, I'm going to do this. I'm, I, I promise. And I was telling myself, I was promising myself, I promise I'm going to work out for the next 90 days every single day. I'm going to follow the system that's set out in front of me so I can get back into the shape that I was in before, maybe even better shape. I promise I'm going to eat the right way. I promise. And every day, I've, I've been saying it every single day. I promise. And Bren, you're the person who inspired me because you started posting your Miracle Morning stuff in the Miracle Morning group. And when I saw that, it, and, and I'd gone through the 30-day Miracle Morning challenge. I'd done all that stuff I, in, my, in my mastermind group. We did it as a group together as well. And that totally inspired me. I'm like, that's it. I'm promising myself I'm doing this every day. Day. So I get on, and I, I took a cue from you again, Brent. I get on Facebook every day, right after I'm finished working out, and I tell everyone, here's, here's where I am. I talk about a quote. I talk about the things that were going through my mind when I was working out. I want to inspire them to keep doing the same thing. I talk about my promise every day. I promise I'm going to make it. And I, today I said, unless a piano falls on my head, somewhere like a Bugs Bunny cartoon, I promise I'm going to make it all the way to 91 days. I promise I'm going to make my goal. And earlier today, I did not feel like working out. And I just started to say out loud to myself, I promise I'm going to do this. I promise. And it made me go do it. It's the different mindset. It's a different feeling. And it's all about that. It's, it's about the feeling you get from that mindset. It's crazy how much just one word can can change the complete emotion of what you're talking about you know that's amazing i've i love that by the way i'm definitely gonna have to use that using promise instead of goals and I, i'll tell you i spent probably like an hour two hours today focused on my goals and my vision and my mission and all that for my life just kind of reorganizing and you know trying to re-articulate some things and i love that that thank you I'm glad I inspired you because you inspired me. No, thank me. you, man. Right You're now. the one who got me back <laughs> into where I needed to be. Yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, well, we're running up on the 30-minute the mark here, which is amazing. I mean, we could probably talk forever, but let's try to keep it to a minimum here. I almost forgot we were on a podcast. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. We'll definitely have to do this again. I loved it. Um, so is there any kind of last words, any kind of closing statement you have uh, before we say goodbye? My last words, I would say this, make sure you have people around you who support you and believe the same things that you believe. What did a lot of people say? I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard it. It might sound like it's, it's said too much, but I don't think it can be said enough. You are the average of the five people 
you spend the most time with. So if you want to raise your average, then get around five people whose average is above yours. Most people are afraid to do that. They're afraid to step up their game and get around people who are more successful, who have maybe more money or are in a better place in life than they are. But the reality is most people like that like to embrace people who want to improve themselves, which is like what I'm doing tomorrow with James. I suggested to him that, hey, why don't we get together for lunch? I'd love to pick your brain. And he was all about it. I want to raise my average. I want to raise the bar for myself, and that's the way to do it. Uh, uh, John F. Kennedy said, a rising tide lifts all ships. So when you rise with other people and everyone's in it together, everyone can achieve so much more. Wow, I love that. I love that. I've, def- I've heard that before, but I've never quite heard it that way. So thank you. Thanks again for coming on the podcast. We're definitely going to have to do this again. Um, yeah, so, for sure. So, Cam, you got any closing words? Any closing statements? Closing words, closing statements. <laughs> this is like I, a new thing I ask everybody on the podcast. Dude, he's wearing a bandana. Kind of- he doesn't have much going on at all. He's like, yo, dude, what's up? Dude, I'm, I'm in my like Pillsbury Doughboy pajamas right now. I'm having a good time. I also worked out my whole Miracle Morning, you know, kind of thing. I made it look all cool. I was a designer. So tomorrow morning, I'll be doing morning motivation on empowerment, which will be fun. So anyways, I think my last statements are thank you guys for listening and watching and uh, wanting and craving this information because... It will change your life if you allow it in. Because like like Brennan said, he heard that quote, but he's never heard it that way. You could hear anything and it'll change your life, you know? So it's it's all on how you how you see it. Love it. Perfect. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for sh- sh- watching this episode. Love it. Share it. Watch it. Whatever you got to do. Um, thanks again, Barrett. Definitely go check out what he's doing over at the Jahanian Group it is. It's, uh, my website is BreakDownTheWall.com breakdownthewall.com and you can learn more about what we what we talked about today and it will be a book we'll see him again soon it will be a book good Good. it will be a book all All right right. well goodbye now thanks guys guys. (laughs) awkward silence awkward silence yeah it was nice meeting you you too peace peace out peace signs up